Hey Deegan, what's in the bag? It's the show where I come home from the comic book store and I show you what's in my bag because I was at the comic book store earlier. I put a timer on so I'm not just rambling uncontrollably. Uh, there's undoubtedly a little bit of that. Uh, what are we starting with? Oh, let's start with this. I was going to start with this. All right, so uh, this is the... This is the wedding issue. Uh, I'm not really invested in, although I am actually uh, getting ready. In my mind, I'm thinking about actually doing the uh, reread of the Krakoa period that I've been intending to do all along. But honestly, I think I was just sort of waiting for it to be done so I could look at it in the past tense. But I've always intended to go back and actually revisit the period as opposed to just watching people talk about it on social media and uh, you know watching people talk about it on YouTube you know the plot sounds interesting for a lot of it even the lighter stuff that I know some of the fans are really down on and they have their you know proponents of uh, you know the Al Ewing stuff certainly in the Karen Gillan stuff as well but it, as a whole, it's just kind of a shambling beast of five years now, isn't it? Started off as one thing, uh, sort of became another, not really. I, it probably didn't end up where anyone was intending from the outset, anyone. But that's just, that's, that's how comic books work. I mean, that's, that's just the plain fact of the matter. That they that everyone was able to stay on the page this much for five years, that in itself is kind of a miracle. Now we can talk about it in hindsight. Uh, you know, it wasn't my favorite period from what I've read, but I also you know freely admit I want to go back and give the whole thing a fair shot as opposed to just the dipping in and out that I've done. So this is the. the are we in your way? This is the big wedding. Uh, the aforementioned Karen Gillan, uh, Rachel Stott. Now, if it were nothing else, just that creative team, the book probably would have come home with me. I really like both of these people. Uh, Karen's been very nice to me over the years, and uh, her Twitter is hilarious. <laughs> uh, Michael Bartolo, Colors. Teeny Howard uh, is doing a story as well with Philip Sevy. I, I like everything of Teeny Howard's I've ever read, just about. I'm sure I haven't read everything uh, by half. Uh, Wyatt Kennedy, I don't know that name. Jen Stonge, Ewan Holly, Stephen Byrne, Tate Bromble, Emilio Pilio. Oh, and there's a reprint. The reason why this fine, because it, you know, it was, it's 10 bucks. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's 10 bucks. And it doesn't even have a hard spine on it. That, uh, that felt a little dear. I must admit, I don't mind spending money on comic books. I get to take comic books off my taxes. So I spend money on comic books. I put money back into the economy that way. But 10 bucks, man, that's, that's a stimulus payment right there. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's a story that people have been waiting. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, do you see how good she looks there? My God, that right there, that makes up almost in one panel. For years, oh my God, for years I've hated her costume since they've gone back to the modified version of, you know, the Jim Lee uniform, which I never cared for. She used to be such an interesting, interesting dresser. And this is, this is a reminder of how well we used to eat Oh, thank you, whoever whoever's idea of the two of you. That that's perfect. That that makes up for everything, right there. That right there, I would have paid. I would have paid twenty to see Rogue look that good. And this, oh man, this looks like they really. That's that's nice. Yeah, you know these these things can be. Um, I mean, this is obviously a grab bag. It's got to have a bunch of people doing things in it, a bunch of characters reacting, and it's all, you know, I haven't read all the Krakoa stuff, but, uh, you know, I pick up on what people are talking about, more or less where the where this uh, status quo for a lot of these guys are. And they spend a lot of time 
on the Captain Britain stuff in the, you know, other world, which, man, I love Chris Claremont, I love Alan Moore, but this thing is literally the bastard child. They're their bastard brainchild, and I can't stand other world for some reason. It just, I, my brain, I love the Claremont Davis Excalibur. It's fantastic, and the Davis Davis Excalibur is great too. Uh, but something about Otherworld, like, this stuff never shows up in other stories. I think they showed up in, like, one of the Spider-Verse, because there was, like, a, a Captain Spider Britain. Eh, you know, it's not, my, it wouldn't be my pick of pairing. But uh, we all know who my pick of pairing would be, and that's, uh, well, you know, I don't need to go into it. I'm supposed to be writing a book about it. I'm going to get back to that one of these days. My enthusiasm for Rogue has not dwindled. My free time to noodle at a completely unremunerative idea has, unfortunately. I can't even make any progress on those uh, Murderer's Row articles. I know people love those, and I'm like two-thirds of the way through the one that I'm just stuck on. Not through any lack of enthusiasm, it's just, uh, they're effortful. They're, they're not easy uh, to write in terms of just actually having to sit down and go back and read a bunch of comics, a lot of which I've never read, some of which I haven't thought about in 30 or 40 years. So This is fun. I'm sure I'll enjoy this when I go back to this. Is this the... Uh, oh. You know me and Emma Frost. Oh, well, of course he has to show up. They've never done a they've never done a big Loki mystique story. That seems like that would be a real natural pairing. Oh, maybe that's an idea I shouldn't give them for free. Oh man, look at how good look at how nice she looks. But then you know he shows up. You know, I know that most rogue, most rogue fans love them together, so I never really say anything uh, about it, but. I remember how both characters were before the relationship even existed. And I think they were both, they were both just stronger characters, uh, separate. I honestly think, and this, even though I'm not a big, big fan of Gambit, just objectively speaking, I think Gambit is like a completely slept on asset, straight up. I don't even like the guy particularly. But, like, they should be on, like, issue 200 of a, you know, Gambit does, you know, basically Catwoman distaff, you know, type book. And they, they, they've done it a couple times. They tried one in the 90s that was a little bit continuity heavy. Uh, and then they tried one with, uh, in the 2000s with Clayman. That was a nice looking book. It was perfect for what a Gambit book should be. And it lasted 12 issues. <laughs> Oh man, she looks so good in this. Ugh. I just, I just don't, I think they could both be doing so many more interesting things apart than as a married couple, because as a married couple, that we've seen, you know, they didn't, they were completely off the board, completely off the board for the entirety of Krakoa. They had a couple limited series, uh, Hickman is on record saying, oh, there was rogue stuff in Inferno. And I had to take it out. She wasn't a part of any of the House of X or Powers of X. Almost like she knew better. Oh, wow, this is so cool. I didn't know this was in here. Chris Claremont interview. Oh, I'll go back. I'll definitely give this a, give this a read. Oh, and it's a little uh, where they're going next. So I guess they're going to appear in, <laughs> that, that makes sense, appear in a Thor Oh, God. I will buy it, a Black Cat book. If you give me a book with just Black Cat in it, I will buy it. Give me a book with Black Cat and Mary Jane as a superhero, and I will avoid it. 
NYX. I have to admit, I'm thinking I might, might give it NYX a shot simply because of how the, the, the Laura's costume. She looks, this costume they got her in, this looks really good. She has never really had a bad costume. Uh, even back to the, you know, very 2000s, you know, tank top look she started with. You know, she she just always looks really good. Uh, showing up in some, man, they make so many of these. Uh, I need to just sit down and start reading these things regularly because they make so many of these uh, online only things. Uh, shows up in an Iceman online thing. And this uh, story from X Factor Annual 6, which was actually, it's in the back of the book. Now, I have this. I have X Factor Annual uh, number 6. It's part of the King's Pain story, but this is the best story. We'll, we'll get to it after we get over this thing. But when I saw that this was reprinted in here, even though I already have the story, I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give that another read. It's, it's an excellent story. One of the best stories Peter David ever wrote. Uh, so, oh, a new, hell, you know, I don't know. I don't buy every Chris Claremont limited series, but he's working regularly enough again that uh, you could just, you know, go back and read a whole pile of very recent Chris Claremont books if you go looking on uh, uh, Unlimited. Now, they haven't given him, they, didn't, they need to just bite the bullet and give him an ongoing again. He'll show up every month. Give him something. Hell, please, give him a Spider-Man book. I've been waiting for Chris Claremont to do another Spider-Man run. Basically, my whole life, he's never really touched the character. And he wrote some of the best Spider-Man stories in the 70s. His Marvel team-up, absolutely pitch perfect. And he never really went back to it. That's, that's what you do. You want to get Spider-Man back on track? Give him to Chris Claremont for a year or two. He'll shape him up. I dare you, Marvel. Come on. So there's an Iceman. Who's, who's writing this? Was, oh, I didn't re recognize that. Uh, I think, yeah. You know, they've, they've made a good faith attempt to, to push Iceman for the occasional solo stuff lately. Although they still got to put Firestar, Iceman, and Spider. There's no Spider-Man, but, you know. That cartoon was on for like a year. A year. And people are never going to let them forget. Yeah, so this was in the back of that X-Factor annual. Because, you know, Mystique was sort of in X-Factor's orbit at the time. She was in everyone's orbit at the time. Uh, she was showing up everywhere already by this point. But yeah, she ended up being a, a big player in X-Factor in the later part of the 90s when the book was uh, really rudderless for years on end. But yeah, this is just, uh, I don't want to say it's, I don't want to say it's like the frankest admission, but you know, it is basically a story that is textually about the fact that this woman has, you know, taken a cruise out to sea, uh, to the sea to scatter the ashes of, of her lover. Uh, and this was, at the time, my favorite, you know, everyone's favorite. Like I say, one of Peter David's, you know, signature work in the X-Box. He may be, you know, he's maybe written more X-Men books than you might remember, even though he never had a run on the main books. Uh, he, he did lots of work, you know, on the sides, here and there. And uh, certainly this story is right up there. You know, well in line, you know, he's a close reader. I mean, we know Peter David is a close reader of Chris Claremont because he took all that, and he took that lesson and applied it to Hulk for, you know, a decade. And the book sold, maybe not like 100% Claremont, like 80% Claremont on a good month. Go back and look at those sales. He sold a lot more copies of the Hulk than Marvel was comfortable with, and that was always the problem. All right, well, that took up a few more minutes. That was a giant size, so maybe we'll put the timer forward another few minutes. I don't want to go too crazy, though. That's a fun book. Now, you know what else I did buy? I bought it. I bought it. The facsimile of Avengers number 10. And you're thinking, wait a minute. You, you already have a copy. 
of Avengers number 10, The First Appearance of Rogue. You've had a copy of The First Appearance of Avengers 10 since like 1993. <laughs> That's how long, you know, I've uh, been a fan of Rogue. But now I, now I have two copies. <laughs> Uh, and this is this is an important comic book on its own right, even if you take out that this is the first appearance of Rogue. This is uh, Michael Golden, early Michael Golden, uh, coming off of Micronauts, because this first came out, this was 1981. Are we anyway? This was 1981. Uh, that, and I'm sure I'll cover this on the TikTok one of these days. Uh, but it's a thick comic, is, is the thing. Uh, and... It, sh it premieres, hello, it premieres the sensational new character find of 1981, our friend Rogue, and the first thing she does on panel, remember, the first thing Rogue ever does on panel is smash Captain America through a wall and French kiss him to death, which, you know, uh, Assault was basically her motif as a supervillain, and that's why she, it's a very good thing she didn't stay a supervillain. Because uh, she, you know, very first thing she does, she doesn't meet the X-Men, no. She's a weapon aimed at the Avengers, and she basically takes the whole team out on her first appearance. And if you think about it, she is mad, like in the modern parlance. She is massively, like Goku level, OP from day one. And people just sort of accepted it because they did such a good job in this book. Uh, and there's, there's Mystique. It's a kind of a paunchy looking Thor there. <laughs> You know, if I do it on the channel, I will get out the original book, but always in her... Uh, let's corner it. Munged. I almost... I almost paid a couple more dollars for the foil cover reprint, but honestly, I don't like those foil covers they've been using. They're, they're, they're too stiff. They're kind of... They don't feel good, and I know that's a real... That's a real uh, specialized problem, but I prefer the regular magazine stock. Plus, if I decide to have it on the show, they're hard to they're hard to take a picture of. So yeah, this is just 1980s Chris Claremont, Michael Golden, about the densest story you have ever read in your entire life. It features. It's basically Avengers versus Freedom Force by Chris Claremont, who was the guy who introduced Freedom Force in uh, in X Men alongside John Byrne. So this is this is a perfect setup. Just hey, let me take my villains and I'll you know put them up against the Avengers. Uh, I think he wrote a few Avengers side stories uh, over the years in this period, so it makes perfect sense. Uh, he actually th this is an important you know, Avengers story for a number of reasons. Even though Chris Claremont never had an Avengers run, he ended up making a really big impact on the Avengers. And he certainly, that, that's something I'll say about Chris Claremont, uh, under any circumstance, anytime he used a character that wasn't his, they were always absolutely apple pie, 100% on character. And that's why his Fantastic Four is fun, even though it's not very good at all because he still like has a really solid bead on those characters. He gets them down really well. And it's, it's fun to read even if the stories are just... <sighs> ended up being prescient. A lot of the stuff that he sort of played around with in the early 2000s ended up coming back, you know, in later iterations from other writers. But, uh, you know, his run was very dense in terms of trying to introduce new ideas to the franchise, but that's kind of how he was. Um, if you give him enough track, he will just invent a bunch of stuff for you. 
you know, he wrote a handful of Avengers story or Avengers tertiary stories. And you can still say, yeah, well, Chris Claremont made a significant impact on, on the Avengers. My God, look at this. There's a reason why Michael Golden basically created an epoch of mainstream comic book art by himself. And I'm not going to say he was the only influence of the image generation because Walter Simonson was right there. But Walter Simonson was someone who, you know, Michael Golden patterned himself on. So, you know, he's that elemental, you know, er figure. I'm obviously going to go a little bit long today because I guess I started talking about Rogue. I need to finish that book. Oh, my God. But yeah, it's it's dense. It's a play by play of a, of a battle where people are using their powers uh, because you know the, they basically have to have to deal with the fact that Rogue took them down completely, like a couple pages solid, and they're not at their at their best at all. And so we spend time talking about that, and then when we get to the, the end here, where Everyone's bikini side at the event at the Xavier Institute, which is always a fun afternoon tea. We get to have a very famous scene. This is the other reason. You know, it, Rogue could have been introduced in another issue, and this would still be a very important book because this is the the payoff, quote unquote of the worst Avengers story, which is Avengers 200, which is this scene here where Carol Danvers basically reads reads the team the riot act over what happened. She's basically just giving all the men whose names are appended to that comic the what for, as it were. And he doesn't give the, the characters an out. He has every opportunity to say that they were being psychically manipulated. He's got Professor X on panel right there. He could step in and say, well... You guys, you, you didn't have a telepath on your team. You don't know you were being, you know, secretly influenced. No. He doesn't give them the out. He basically just says to these characters, like, you screwed up in a big way. And that's a part of all these characters. And the X-Men's history as well. Because the X-Men end up taking in Carol Danvers. And then they end up losing Carol Danvers as well. Which is a story that really you have to see Chris Claremont was setting up right from the beginning. That was his move with Rogue, was to create, to, to use this really unfortunate Avengers story as the basis to basically uh, introduce one of the most popular X-Men of all time. You gotta admit, that's a pretty decent long game. You gotta give uh, the old buzzard that. You know, and the ads on these, I'll, straight up, if you ever have a copy of Avengers Annual 10 in your hand, a real copy, you'll see uh, the ads are scanned. And you can, you can tell, if you've read the originals, you know that they look a lot crisper. Although, not this page, because this, this was probably a page they had a good scan of. Oh, man. Tom Brevoort has been asked, in the past, about possible uh, anthologies of the hostess stories. Uh, he has said, in the past, he doesn't think... Uh, it would be worth the trouble, but I think he has an I haven't seen him answer that question in at least 10 years. Maybe the realities on the ground have changed culturally in the intervening decade. Maybe someone sh should uh, think to ask, because that might be something that uh, they can move a few copies of. That, that would actually probably be a book that a lot of people would buy, <laughs> at least in my social circle. Well, that says a lot about your social circle. Yes, it does. Uh, we got to look at more of this. got to look at something else. We can't just have me sit here and kill all this time. It's 
supposed to be talking about all these new comics. I talked about two X-Men books. Uh, it's a sickness is what it is. It really is. Okay, let's look at this. Because I'm still buying Detective Comics. Uh, and the reason I'm buying Detective Comics, it's not a book that anyone's talking about anymore. It had a uh, first few months, it seems like people were really oohing and on over it. And then when it seemed like uh, Ram V, the, the writer here, was really, he, he was settling in, uh, not for a good time, but for a long time. <laughs> uh, I could tell it was a book that, you know, from the very beginning was being written with a, the eye of telling a, a very long story, or at least a sustained mood. So I haven't been uh, maybe reading it as assiduously. But let me tell you, I don't miss it. it I don't miss it because uh, the Ram V run, uh, the entirety of it, has also had, and this is the other reason I'm buying it for, these Evan Cagle characters, which, you know, this silly camera here can't even uh, begin to communicate uh, how gorgeous these, these covers are. This man really puts a great deal of work. Uh, in, into this work. I, I think my mom would really, really appreciate this guy. That's, you know, about the highest compliment uh, I can give. But, you know, I'm, I'm mature. I understand it's okay sometimes to buy a comic because it has a really, really good-looking cover. I'm putting money back into the local economy. But... The point is, uh, I have only really been skimming what Ram V's been doing because, you know, as I get older, that, that tends to be what I am more satisfied by. I pick a series or two or three that I like, and I let them pile up for a while, and then go back and, you know, let them breathe. And this is one that I need to, I really need to go back and pick up on because I have no idea what's going on. It. But it's gorgeous. Uh, Art by Stefano Raphael, colors by Lee Lawfridge. You know, he's practically enough to give the book a flip just on his own. It, had a, it actually it has some decent variant covers. Yet it had a uh, Gene Haw cover this month with the, the, the Jean Dijoux character that I love, absolutely adore. Uh, excellent non-binary representation. It's not something... I'm going to draw attention to too often, but I like that character for that reason. Uh, but I buy this book partly, big part, because of these cable covers. So, Plus, also, you know, I, I don't, I, I always feel like it's a little bit weaselly to ever reward the whole, like, we're going to put a character on the cover of this book that isn't in the book. Both companies do it. And honestly, I think it's just scummy. I think it's just straight up scummy, you know, putting an X-Men cover on a Spider-Man book. Come on. Come on. You think we were born yesterday? I mean, I get it, man. I get it. If they say inflation's down, that doesn't make groceries uh, any cheaper. Uh, man, oh, they got a they got a book coming out for this. Now, if they get some nice covers, like if, if they got Dan Hip covers, I might actually get this because I like this series. Uh, I'm going to one of these days. I'm going to have to break down and just get the uh, what is it? The what are they calling it? The Max now, uh, so I can catch up because I've seen a couple episodes and I really do like that. That, that was a good adaptation, but I'm you know like. One and a half seasons behind on a two on a two season show. So, uh, who's doing the backup here? Oh, we're not on the backup yet. Mister Freeze. He he show, he was showing up in some of the interesting backups that they were getting. I think Casper Wingard to draw. So yeah, it's a long, long story with a sprawling cast that's made up of. A number of the villains, Mr. Freeze, uh, Scarecrow, although the, I don't like that Scarecrow mask at all. Uh, I think Two-Face was in it. Two-Face was in 
the, the, the first part of the story when I was uh, paying attention. Mr. Freeze, Alex Pacnato, Christopher Mitten, Travona Farrell. Yeah, and they've been getting generally decent, solid people to do the backups. And there's that Ramona Fraden. And here's the, the barter book that they're doing. The um, They did the free comic book day, and it actually looked kind of interesting for, you know, I'm really actually kind of tickled pink that this format, YA graphic novels, is just taking off like a rocket, just without anyone really in the mainstream comics industry barely even noticing. They make so many of these books. And they wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't a market for this material. Uh, and that's going to, you know, turn out to be, you know, a big part of these characters' lives, I think, going forward. But they're, they're also going back and they're, uh, they're reprinting some of those graphic novel series uh, in floppy format. We looked at one of the, the Batman issues that, uh, oh, Jeffrey Brown, Jeffrey Brown doing Batman. What a world, what a world. Uh, there's got to be something else. Yeah, I know. I only wanted these to be 20 minutes, but... Okay, we'll just flip through this. There's a new Torpedo book out. Uh, I don't know if anyone's paying attention to it, but it's got Eduardo Rizzo doing it. So you're going to probably want to at least look, look through it at some point. Uh, Torpedo, you know, he's a character who has never really had too much play. I think maybe his stuff has been printed in this uh, country, but, um, you know, Ablaze, they, they've actually been catching my eye with some uh, European reprints of late that, that I've been rather impressed by. I, I, I don't much care for their very uh, generic sort of editorial. Uh, they, they don't have a strong, like, uh, brand identity in my mind, other than I generally like what I buy of theirs because they put out good stuff from Europe. And straight up, if you put good European stuff on the direct market, you know, that's, that works for me. That format works for me. Uh, so, and I bought this because it had the Grand Sajuka cover. I'm really happy. People are coming around. On this guy. I'm not going to give myself credit. I'm not going to say that, oh, you reading the um, Marjorie Finnegan Temporal Criminal book on your TikTok show, that helped spur the um, Sajuka songs, as it were. I'm not going to say that I did that. But I was at least on the right side of history as far as Grand Sajuka goes. That guy is really good. Of course, he's not drawing this comic. This comic is being drawn by Mr. Eduardo Rizzo. And it's a, it's a manifest shortcoming on my part that crime just isn't my bag. And, you know, I, I've read a lot of crime comics because there are so many good crime comics in history, but it is, it is by far my least favorite genre. It, it just is. And it, you, go, but you can even go back and look. I've only reviewed a few crime comics over my years. And every time I do, I end up just being like, what the hell, man? Like, this isn't for me. It, look, it's gorgeous. But it, it just ain't for me. <laughs> if they had ray guns, I'd be there. Swords, I'd be down. Something about crime stuff that would just... You know what I think it was? I think it was because... My dad liked crime stuff, and my mom, my mom watched crime stuff too, and so it just was never really a, you know, sexy genre for me. And I, I say that, and we got two pages of Eduardo Rizzo drawing, many pages of Eduardo Rizzo drawing, uh, comely ladies, which is a reason to buy Torpedo. Definitely, you know, familiar with the character and with the genre. Uh, so this woman's about to, about to get it, and she gets saved by the 
by the bodyguard who, yeah, see, this is just 1972. I guess this is, a, you know, early 70s period, um, you know, ugly clothing and really garish European take on that, you know, uh, crime exploitation material from the period. But look at how gorgeous this is. And it's my fault entirely. I just, I haven't really read any. I need to go back and just give, you know, sit down and read all of 100 Bullets in a single go, because I haven't really read any of it. Because crime, man. And so much of what was happening in comics in the 2000s was the resurgence of crime fiction, because you had like Bendis, Azarello, Rucka, all those guys coming in. Crime fiction was their number one coming up, and they put it in everything they write. Bro Baker, my God. And I, like I say, man, you know. But look at this, there's no denying. And that's why every time, you know, I bite the bullet, you know, I sit down and read some, <laughs> you know, torpedo or something like that. I'm like, oh, this is gorgeous. <laughs> uh, man, this is gorgeous, though. I do wish Rizzo would do more sci-fi. Rizzo has done some excellent sci-fi in his career. He's done some good fantasy, too. Um, I just mentioned Saint Seiya the other day, and this is that some of that Jer this is some of that Jerome uh, Alke uh, Saint Seiya stuff, which I mentioned the other day when I did the first um, episode of the uh, Captain Harlock on the TikTok. I mentioned that he also did some uh, Saint Seiya books, but Saint Seiya never really had it, it has never had any following. Really, and, 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 you know, if you're a Saint Seiya fan, you know I'm right. It has just never hit uh, in this country. But it's coming, apparently. I mean, you know, everything. It, it probably found an audience now that it didn't have before. Because um, Alke, he did Harlock, and he did Saint Seiya in the French market. And, you know, that's a sign of the health of the French market uh, and the thirst of the French market for manga. Like, France, the scuttlebutt, the word on the street is that France just buys new series, sight unseen, from Japan, which America doesn't do. Not er look, Listen to me talking like I'm, a, like I'm an expert in the, in the manga field here. I still say manga when I'm, when I'm not careful. <laughs> That's how old school... I am. You know, I remember seeing the ads for part of my French Japanimation. That's how they sold it to us. And, you know, I realized it was a, it was just a snap realization the other day. I sort of got a, a mad on against anime very early because when I was very young, the local channel put Mazinger on before He-Man. Oh man, so the fix was in. I was never gonna like Mazinger. Mazinger was always like the slow old cartoon that they put on while I was like biting my fingers down to the bone waiting to see if it was gonna be a new episode of He-Man <laughs> because that's like what mattered in 1984. And if you were around in 1984, you know. Now I'm not still that, I'm not attached to He-Man at all anymore. I don't think I've enjoyed it. Uh, more than two or three He-Man stories since I turned six. But, uh, yeah, the fix was in. What can I say? And now I watch industrial amounts of anime. <laughs> I'm going to stop recording videos and go watch some anime because that's just the shape of my life in 2024. So, all right, I, I really want to keep these ones down under 20 minutes. And I also want to talk about more than three comics. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll record two episodes. Maybe I'll just do that. There's no law that says I can't do that. So, um, you know, check out the Patreon. Check out the, uh, 
the TikTok and the Instagram. Check out the uh, podcast. Check out the Comics Journal. And have a wonderful day.